All right, here we go. This is John Reed, and this is the hardest part of the entire show, which is me trying to get Thomas's last name right. Thomas, you ready for this? Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joined by Thomas Weberniet. How's that? Close. <laughs> But a little yet, bit closer. Yet, yet, yet is kind of Russian. <laughs> oh, that wasn't quite right. How about night at the end? <laughs> night, night. Oh yeah. man. Be well, I blame night. I blame Be Google because Google. I practiced it on the Google Translator. So, uh, how about deeper? <laughs> yeah. Well, this actually it's good. It's a good segue to our topic, right? Which is yeah. oh, Gen AI is great for translation. Well, not not when you get the wrong, no. wrong uh, sound. But I practiced. Yeah, so, well, all right, that gives me something to shoot for for next time. So here we are with our yeah. workshopping generative AI uh, topic. So, and the best part about this is I have some slides, and Thomas has absolutely no idea where I'm headed with this. So, um, so let's let's bring those up now. Uh, this this actually was this really old slide deck, and the funny thing about this is that uh, one uh, one really uh, good use case for me in Gen AI is building my slides. I haven't been able to do that yet, but I sure as hell could use some help. But anyway, I, when I was going through this old legacy slide deck, I like this second point. I think the enterprise and its so-called thought leaders need to laugh at itself more and acknowledge its own flaws and biases. My content reflects that. I think that's pretty much a perfect uh, perfect segue for our discussion today yeah. uh, because I am... I'm biased on this topic and I'll explain a little bit why what triggered this event and what the heck is workshopping. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, you're welcome to comment in the chat. You're part of the workshopping as well. Workshopping is the missing link between half baked ideas and a formal methodology. So Thomas and I did this once before, uh, with, uh, with hyper personalization and it was really productive for me. I, I don't know about you, Thomas, but, I actually got enough out of that conversation where I could actually write, I think, something much more formal on it. So this and show fulfilled its purpose. Of laughing at each other or ourselves and other people. Hi, Tracy. Always good to see you. Hi, Tracy. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. So the only problem is then I have to actually write about it. And I haven't written about the workshopping session yet. But the workshopping session accomplished its goal. So I thought, well, this is the perfect opportunity to do it again. And uh, I actually want to start with uh, this uh, thing. I don't know if you saw this, Thomas. This, this kind of hit the LinkedIn viral stream a couple of times. Uh, you can see the clip. Uh, Dr. Jochen Wolf surfaced this on my timeline. I want AI to do my laundry and dishes so that I can do art and writing. Not for AI to do my art and writing so that I can do laundry and dishes. Uh, I think that struck a chord with a with a lot of people, and um, I I found it fascinating because I think it kind of I don't know summarizes a lot of the problems uh, and and issues uh, with with the state of AI at the moment, which is that some of the things that we most would want AI to do are actually not really that easy, and robotics turns out to be a pretty tough set of problems for AI and. and there, there, there is progress being made, but a lot of times in controlled environments. And so this sort of fantasy of robots doing all our heavy lifting for us is not there yet. And I wrote uh, in the comment there, freaking nailed it. Unfortunately, the AI that does that kind of physical movement on the home front is very far away and surprisingly more difficult than many think. Although I guess you can vacuum your floors with that little Roomba thing that's been around for years. Uh, Whereas the AI that can attempt to appropriate our writing and art, however, imperfectly and problematically is available now to be used and abused. And sure enough, it's being used and abused. So, so this kind of triggered me, Thomas, but it, it doesn't end there. Uh, the other trigger is PR bullshit overdose. So I, wa I want to show you what happened there. So this was, this was the next one. Uh, I got this uh, email in May. It was uh, cheap content is now king, oh. and uh, <laughs> so look, I have I, I have a dog dog in this fight, right? Because like, look, um, you know, I I make I make a living on uh, I'm going to switch layouts for a sec because this is important. I, I make a living on quality content, right? And so, like, I'm not going to lie that this is threatening to my worldview. And for some time, I kind of took the stance. Hello, Ethan. 
Great to see you. Yes. Friday afternoon show. Try to <laughs> hope hope you have your drink of choice in hand. It was nice to see you last week. Um, so so anyway, so so on the qual- quality front, like my my whole high ground has been that quality content still matters. And if quality content matters, then g- whatever Gen AI does with content, like is not going to disrupt my worldview. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. And it, no, it's, it's not. not it's not because generative AI can create quality mm-hmm. content. It's because there's a lot of arguments to be made around where mediocre content is actually good enough content. And we're going to get into some of the nuances of that during our discussion. But 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 getting back to the, the slides for a moment here. So I, I got this PR pitch around this, and this is indicative of my inbox. I get this kind of thing a lot. Early use cases are showing significant benefits from microservices to video production. Companies are finding large scale success, 97% reduction costs in captioning. To which I replied, I'm with you on this, though captioning's been available for years. And as a user for AI for video production, I can tell you it is an excellent help, but not a game changer. Why? Because it doesn't understand the content well enough to know exactly what I would need, but it's definitely helped. Thomas, I'm interested. Uh, I'll stop there for a moment, um, bring you into that because I know. You're an avid video producer via CRM combos. Uh, I've written articles on Diginomica about my experiments with AI for video editing and its interesting use case. Ultimately, I have found that it has greatly expedited my ability to produce shorter clips from longer videos, which I think is a terrific use case in our industry in particular. Because the live show is one thing, right? Where people can comment and be a part of it and come in and out. But let's face it, how many people are going to watch this entire show on replay? Like, not that many. So there's a really good argument for highlighting some key clips. And I think AI is actually pretty good at that. I don't know what you think. But one thing I have noticed, though, is I don't. it's not good enough to do that automagically for me. I don't want it to just take 10 clips and post it. What I do is I get it to produce the clips. I go through, I pick the clips I want. I, I do a little bit of tweak and then and then they go out when I do the shorter clips. Uh, what what is your experience? Is this like really helped you in the video video editing realm? Yes, <laughs> that's the short answer. the The long answer is um, I, I'm not doing it consistently enough. That's part one. Part two is you can't just have the system do it. You need to give a bunch of or a number, not a bunch of good enough keywords into the system and there is no way of not doing some post-production after the short clips have been created especially if there's a setting of more than two people like our crm convos in general i guess what this tool regularly uses let's say the settings that i don't like (laughs) right we don't like or whatever there are some some speaking pauses in between some lengths that could be cut out or some other parts that should be added actually which is hard to be done there but just the ability of creating those shorter clips that are good enough they are mostly not great they are good enough gives a a, a lot of highlight to people so there, there's good information coming out and even better. So we are doing, not doing the CRM converse for, for monetary purposes. Well, <laughs> we'd love to, but it doesn't, doesn't work out like that for the time being. If, if there's another hit on the full show, great. If right. not, well, no harm done. And those tools are in, right now in the vicinity of 100 bucks a year. So that doesn't make anybody really poor. So I would encourage people trying these things out. And there are several of those vendors, which I won't name now. Yeah, and, so, and I've, I've written about it. I've named yeah. some vendors in my pieces. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think what you just described is fairly indicative of what mm-hmm. a lot of what I'm seeing um, is, is that these tools, and we can idealize them, but they actually do need a lot of adult supervision. Yeah. But applied properly, they can be very interesting because like in my case, for example, I wouldn't have time to produce clips on my own. Like I can do it technically, but I don't Mm -hmm. have time. So this makes the difference between whether I can actually do that or not. 
which is a lot different than a job displacement conversation, which is yeah. another conversation we need to have. And, and uh, you know, th this quality issue is interesting because one of the reasons why the Screenwriters um, Guild and, and the Hollywood Writers Strike happened around this topic and the negotiations around it were because they felt threatened by this. And, and again, it wasn't because they... It wasn't a, it wasn't because they thought that Jenny and I could write a script anywhere near as good as what a human could do. But there's a couple of issues that you have to think about, which is what is our tolerance level for mediocrity? Because there's a lot of mediocre bullshit that comes out of Hollywood all the time that is written by humans that does pretty well, especially if there's a lot of high production values and big explosions mm -hmm. and you know stuff like that. So so one issue is one of the unresolved questions in all of this is is what is the human appetite for uh, for mediocre content? But the second part is around that was they were concerned about AI generation of raw materials that then they would be asked to essentially hone, but then they wouldn't get, actually get the royalty or the credits mm. around that. And so, so, so it is interesting because while I want to have an enterprise conversation today, it's interesting to look at what some of the concerns around these tools have been because I think if if these tools weren't at all threatening. Um, then, then there wouldn't have been that kind of ruckus around this negotiation. And so there is something there. Um, one of the unresolved questions in this sort of cheap content is king conversation that does apply to the enterprise is if it's incredibly cheap to produce content that's acceptable, at what point is, is, it, is there utter commoditization of content? Uh, so uh, which, which kind of gets back to back to the email for a moment because mm -hmm. I, I want to continue with this email because I think it's sort of important. Uh, so, so the pitch continues. The ability to quickly and cost of, cost effectively transition between 120 languages and a significant reduction in time and cost to create um, new content. Now, I don't want to skip over that 120 languages part because we're going to get to some of the use cases. And I, th I do think that translation between languages is a powerful use case. That being said, yeah. some of the translations are imperfect, which is part of the reason why I'm a little mm -hmm. suspi suspicious of Gen AI, in this, Gen AI in this context, because I think one of the reasons people like creativity for Gen AI is because it sucks at getting things right in a nonfiction sense. So, <laughs> so creativity is actually kind of a, gives me a margin for error. Yeah. That doesn't really work so well with translation between languages where inside jokes and nuanced points of view get lost. Anyway, so I said, okay, I'll take you up on that. I've seen plenty of mediocre net new content from AI. I'd like to see just one example of quality net new content where AI significantly reduced the time or was the primary creator aside from image generation. Right now, what I see is a lot of flooding of the market with mediocre content. In turn, to get attention, you either have to go viral with outrageous stuff, which I know doesn't work in the industries that, I, that you and I work in, Thomas. <laughs> Or alternately, turn in better content, which I think is the more optimistic part of this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, more expert, more relevant to get attention. And I've seen no evidence that AI, AI can do that. So ironically, AI, AI's ability to put out so much mediocre content is making it harder to actually use AI to produce really good content so mm -hmm. the bar is so much higher. So anyway, I, I think it's interesting because I think some of the purveyors of this crap are, gonna, are in for a little bit of a rude awakening in the sense that we have limited attention and limited attention spans. And if we're going to flood the market with content, and if everyone is empowered to do that, something's got to give. Mm. Something has to give because we can't all we can't all consume all the content that we can mm. produce with these tools. So I think it's an interesting dilemma. Let's let's stick a little bit to shows like we are doing. Yeah. So let's take this here and Conrose. So there's not only a post production effort, but also a production effort. Right. So now, even for preparation, time is short for the guests as well as for us. And we are usually, uh, let's say, not in the, in our most well known and covered topics. So it's, there's always a fringe topic, a side topic, or an interesting facet that we cover as well. So now you need to come up for, well, you need to come up with talking points. You need to come up with a synopsis, unless you are purely workshopping like we are doing right now, which, yeah, which you're yeah, often yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. But you, you, you need to get a couple of talking points. You have formal, an idea. Formal guests yeah. tend to like yeah. to see the talking yeah. points and stuff yeah, like that, but, right? Yeah, but even for your own mental preparation. Right. So you have a bunch of points, questions. 
that, that you get. Maybe it's three, four, five. Then, hey, this show is taking an hour or it's planned for an hour. So three, four, five might not be enough depending on how the back and forth and the conversation flows. Incoming at GPT. Hey, these are some talking points with an expert on this and that and whatnot. The, we, we want to talk about this facet. What are some additional interesting questions? And well, the thing drops out 10, 15 questions and well, we might just choose three or five and adopt them, change them, adopt them. Then yeah. we have that thing. And well, you need a synopsis for a, a description for all of those channels where, where this is. I now can write one myself or I can just dump it in again right. say, hey, write me a synopsis, not more than 100 words and make it snarky. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think, again, I think we're talking about uh, supporting creative efforts, which gets me to yeah. which gets me to one of the points. Now, I'm not going to go through; these are all discussion points that we may hit on today. Yeah. Um, and and there's another slide full of them too. Uh, but uh, but this one gets into the second to the last point, yeah. which is semantics matter to me. So. Yeah. I'm arguing against creativity for what you're describing there. I, I think a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of what what I want to see from vendors, and I'm so sick of seeing that vendors saying, you know, creative this or creative that. Like job description generation is not content creation. Just stop it, stop it. That's content generation. It's what, not even what, generation. <laughs> yeah, generative in terms of creative. It's we're using the word creativity in a very yeah. sloppy manner here. And and by the way, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on point one here because we're going to move on from this point. Mm. But this creativity, whatever is possible, mm. is trained on the backs of mostly uncompensated yeah. artists. So let's let's just say that. Like mm. like so, for example, I was watching some some songs written by uh, Gen AI on YouTube, and um, the only reason Gen AI can compose those songs is because it's been trained off the back of a ton of artists music that were never compensated for that effort. So let's just say it's just, it's just flat out um, mm -hmm. strip mining that those artists back catalog. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on there. And um, you know, some of that will get settled legally. And now the output is different. I don't necessarily think the output is, uh, is, is, is a legal violation. It's the training. That's mm -hmm. the violation in my opinion. But, um, but anyway, the output, a uh, little soulless, a little unimpressive, but the thing is mm -hmm. that it 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 happens because of what goes into it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, whether whether you can truly call that creative or not, the thing to the thing that I'm struck by is that even to get that output requires some skill in the prompts. Like mm -hmm. like so 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 part of what I was looking at is the prompts people use to create the songs that they wanted to hear, mm -hmm. and the prompts like were sophisticated. And so, so that there's still a human on. element. There's a, still a yeah. human element there it's in mandatory. pulling out what you want. Yeah. So, it, it, a lot of it depends on how you define creativity. I just took the liberty yep. of asking ChatGPT what, what the definition of creativity oh, great. is. Let me give it verbatim. Okay. Creativity is the ability to generate, develop, and express original, imaginative, and valuable ideas. These are three big words. <laughs> Solutions are artistic expressions. It involves thinking outside conventional boundaries, combining existing concepts in new ways and producing novel outcomes that can be appreciated for their innovation, aesthetic value or practical utility. Oh my God. Creativity can be applied across various domains, including art, science, technology, business, everyday problem solving. I think the, the, not, the value is already in the first part. Original. Right. Yep. There's nothing original in whatever gets right. done of a generative AI system. Indeed. And I'm going to show you all some definitions of creativity later that I think are yeah. maybe less boring than that one. But I do think the orig <laughs> the, the, the originality, <laughs> the originality thing, I think, does jump out. Um, yeah. We've hit on, we've actually hit on most of these points already. Uh, yeah. But one, one point I do want to really hit on, though, is before generative AI came the algorithmic economy, um, which is not a content meritocracy. And I think this is really, really important because 
part of this sort of content generation. I mean, content generation in the enterprise has a bunch of different use cases, and we'll get into some of those shortly. But um, but but one of them is obviously marketing based stuff, earning attention and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. earning attention is 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 not a meritocracy. I mean, when I go on LinkedIn, like the, the idea that I'm being shown the best content is absolutely patently false. And, and that's been false for a long time. I mean, I write my weekly hits and misses and I curate that based on RSS feeds. And the reason I do that is because Thomas, like I want, I, I subscribe to your blog, for example, and your stuff and doesn't always, <laughs> you, you, yeah, exactly. Your stuff doesn't always get surfaced on social channels. Mm-hmm. It just, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And, and a lot of times it's probably worthy of my attention. But I don't see it. You know what I see instead? I see, oh, I'm so thrilled that my colleagues and I, you know, uh, we built this amazing new logo and, you know, whatever, like, I, and everyone likes it. And so there's all this engagement. So, and, and this is one of the things that's been a wake up call for me is this notion that engagement has become a proxy for quality in the eyes of the algorithm. Um, and at its worst, this is very disturbing because like when I moderate my local group on Facebook, a lot of the posts that get the most promotion by Facebook are, are the ones where people are attacking each other <laughs> and, fi- and fighting each other because yeah. Facebook's like, oh, that's quality because everyone is engaged. And it's like, no, that's actually crap. Um, but, but anyway, so, so there's, there's not a content mer- meritocracy out there, which is something to keep in mind because the algorithm is making a lot of decisions about what to show you. And so even if generative AI comes up with good content, that doesn't mean it's going to be any more visible than anybody else's. Mostly content is kind of like a high school popularity contest in the cafeteria. Uh, some, people, some people win based on their huge followings and their popularity, and some people lose, and then you're trying to push back against that in all the different ways that you can. Um, so I think that's an interesting sort of subtopic to this conversation. Yeah, and there's one more. LinkedIn for a few months now has this funny feature rewrite with AI. Oh yeah. I, so I sometimes try it and I'm more disgusted with it about <laughs> with it than with my own writing. Which truly is not always great. But anyway, so thinking about it a step further. So not following or following the recommendation or the rewriting of the system that supposedly makes it supposedly makes it more engaging or more quality then it should be transported more right so isn't that the system judging its own quality indeed um and and by the way those of you watching if you have some comments on this uh, this conversation is heading somewhere i have another slide i want to get to um, but if you have some comments, feel free to put them in on on this. I want to get into a little bit more of the enterprise use cases here. Um, okay. But I did I did want to hi- I did want to highlight this this last bullet point: two models for attention in the enterprise, virality, vanity metrics versus reaching the right people. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm hopeful that reaching the right people is still going to matter because otherwise, I'm not going to have a career, and um, I'll be bus I'll be busking on the street corner, and I won't be doing these video shows anymore. Um, but it is an interesting contrast. So different models for generative AI use cases. Is creativity really the killer use case? Uh, I'm not so sure. And uh, Phil Rainwright recently did a post on Diginomica, my colleague Phil, very smart guy. And he was, he was um, this was actually from Atlassian's Team 24 conference, if you want to look for the post. But the models include facilitate, which are things like digital assistance, find, retrieve, which is all kinds of search stuff, summarize and draft, would get, which gets into a little bit of what we're talking about, and then transform and analyze. Um, so I think it's actually really interesting because if you go a little further down this list here on the valid content generation use cases, and notice I did not say creativity, I said content generation. I think that distinction matters a whole hell of a lot. Uh, one is those who struggle to write. Right. So, or write in a particular language. Um, power of translation, the power of syntax. For example, a classic example would be screenwriting. Like, if I, I think if I wrote another script again, I've written a couple of scripts, I would have Gen AI fill out all the, the script syntax, right? Gen AI is really good at syntax, which is why it's pretty good at code. Uh, multimodal, uh, 
really good for summarization, brainstorming. We can talk about how creative that actually is. Cross-checking your work. You can ask Gen AI, like, poke some holes in what I just wrote. Show me why this is wrong. Show me what I missed. That's really interesting. Um, so anyway, I think there's really interesting ways to to use this technology in the context of of content. And like Thomas, I think the example, the productivity examples are interesting around like whether it's helpful to have like LinkedIn write something for you or not. Like, cause what I find is that we we had generative AI like take a transcript from an interview we did and like mm-hmm. write an article about it. And it was actually fairly impressively done, but the problem was just all the jargon. Like it's been trained on so much tech jargon and I don't, mm. I hate jargon heavy writing. And so for me to, to take all the jargony crap out of an article, it would actually be faster for me to start from scratch. But that's because like I'm a writer, like there's a lot of shit I'm not very good at. I'm good at writing. So for me, like that's not a problem, but I have talked with people who say, this gives me a huge head start. And you can certainly see, especially in informal use cases, like things like mm-hmm. email uh, correspondence, how that's eventually going to be really useful. And maybe it'll even be useful in hyper-personalization. But if you want to mm-hmm. talk about that, check the replay of our last workshop. So so what are you yeah. thinking about, Thomas, in terms of uh, enterprise use cases? Because I think the multimodal thing is really interesting, right? Because when I think about things that I can't do very well, like take like a, um, an article and turn it into a PowerPoint, for example, that would take me a long time. I think pretty soon Gen AI is going to be able to do that pretty quickly. Yeah, maybe. So I, I'm still struggling sometimes with their, or with the AI's ability to summarize free-flowing conversations because mm. they don't always have, well, they are not structured enough to do a good summarization for, for the system. This is probably because they still don't have enough of a context window so that they can collect the overall context well enough out of a, let's say, one hour or two hour conversation. So right. that's hard for ourselves. Yeah, that's, it's hard for us. So probably not, not really fair to blame it on some technology that it can't do that if we can't do it ourselves. So there, I don't see the, the real, Well, the real one system. So when it comes to enterprise use cases, I actually tend to currently tend to think that it's necessary to have several different systems work, cooperate in an orchestrated way. However, this orchestration then works. But I do not think that we have the one LLM to rule them all, to quote a great set of movies. Or great author, actually, so not the set of movies. So here's an interesting one, um, and and by the way, those who are listening, if you if you want to share any of your use cases, I'm particularly interested in enterprise use cases that are operating at a, a kind of a larger scale. Um, but there are also personal mm-hmm. productivity use cases, obviously, that are interesting. Um, I wanted to get back briefly to the instant mediocrity at scale. Uh, and this notion of how accepting will be will be be a mediocre content because I think part of what is what what I've had to accept, Thomas, is that some enterprise leaders are going to use this, even if it's not not generating the best content. They are going to use this to save money and time, and and it wets the ap- appetite for headcount reduction. The instant mediocrity goes from a very smart individual you and I both know, high in Park analyst over at Amalgam Research. And I think instant mediocrity at scale is a really interesting way to think about this because Mm -hmm. there actually are use cases where that kind of makes sense. And then when you get to this next slide here, the best use cases in learning, including product FAQs, require expert data. Well, this is what gets a little bit interesting about enterprise AI because you can take, Mm -hmm. take that capability to post like instant mediocrity as, as Park described it. But instead, feed in the prompts via your so-called retrieval augmented generation techniques and stuff like that. Feed in the required clean quality data about a particular product, right? And then have generative AI generate Mm. FAQ type information around that. 
that actually is interesting because that mm-hmm. that's not totally mediocre anymore because when I read an FAQ, I'm not expecting um to for it to be like um, you know, whatever, catcher in the rye or Tolkien Lord of the Rings or whatever you might pick your writer. I don't I don't need that. I, I just need really informative information. And I think that is well within the scope of of generative AI. Uh, and and yeah. suddenly the suddenly the instant mediocrity is not quite so mediocre because it's being honed by very specific inputs. I think that's fairly interesting. Yes, it is. And that actually points into one of the major challenges that, that are there right now. I do think that RAG is a, a band-aid. Oh, yeah. Why is, why is the band-aid? Because we train those systems on all sorts of stuff, right. be, it, <laughs> be it dirty laundry or <laughs> high fashion. Yeah. And if with that, the results that come out of those systems are great only by chance, by accident almost. So right. this means that the training systems need to be vastly improved. And this need, this basically says that we, that there is a word to be said for expert systems. Right. I'm using this old term in a new, in a novel yep. way right now. So trained on expert data so that quality output can come. Right. So th- th- that is something that's totally missing right now. So, and if we manage to get that, then the instant mediocrity or mediocrity, mediocre, ah, well, <laughs> the, the bad stuff becomes a notch better or two, two notches better, actually. Yeah. Which then, if prepared properly, gives a strong signal in all the noise that's getting created by the mediocrity. Right. And, you know, we could get into that a little further because I, I tend to view our rag and some of the things that are being tied to rag is a little more sophisticated than a band aid because rag is also rag, rag is also being connected now to things like knowledge graphs and yeah. and some of the content that's being inputted into the prompts yeah. to restrict the LLMs around that material is is a little stronger than a band aid but I, I would agree that it's something of a crutch in that the true yeah the true AI scientists that I study don't take RAG seriously. They don't, they don't consider it a major breakthrough. Yeah. So when you hear enterprise vendors like extolling the virtues of RAG, like it's some miracle thing, it's definitely not. Yeah. It, it, it's a bit of a kludge. But, but Thomas, it, it, it is more, I, I, more effective than a band-aid. What I would call a band-aid would be the guardrails that companies like, like Google have tried to construct around their LLMs that they can actually be broken with ease. These guardrails are an attempt to control the, to, to make sure the output is civilized and not politically offensive, but those guardrails don't work. And, and so that's what I refer to as like band-aids because they're very, very limited in their effectiveness and they can be worked around. Yeah. But, but, but ultimately, I think you're right that, that a lot of times domain-specific models of the future, they're going to be smaller, they're going to be more focused, they're going to be well-trained on your specific data. I've heard some really good anecdotes the spring at events, I'm not, you probably have as well things like, for example, if you have compliance related material you're trying to generate, let's say, um, y- you can train a specific domain only on that, the compliance related data that you're trying to study mm-hmm. and, and, and adhere yeah. to, right? And, and that's going to give you a much more focused output. Now, yeah. the one thing I will say is that the large language models, they're not, it's not just, mm-hmm. When, when you when you when you move away from them, you are losing a little bit of the versatility of communication, like like some of the chatty aspects that those large language models are really good at when they're given a front end chatty chatty interface. Mm-hmm. They're more versatile in their ability to engage with humans, but a lot of times you don't need that, right? Because you're just trying to use an LLM to generate product documentation and stuff like that, or job descriptions or yeah. performance reviews. You don't need like some extremely savvy like like chatbot in order to do that and so anyway it's going to be really interesting to see because i think those things will help but i consider those somewhat like lobotomized use cases they don't get to the heart of this creativity debate but they are interesting and and then there's this whole thing around job loss and professional impact which at the moment i think is fairly unequally distributed so i i made i made kind of a short list of of hard hit jobs things like designers translators mm. 
some freelance copywriters. And uh, the question there becomes, do we overlook all the elements that go, that go into expert enterprise writing? Because when, when we did that um, experiment at Diginomica, and by the way, Diginomica doesn't use Gen AI in any uh, of our writing, and we've published uh, a position on that. I think we're the only media company in the world that has done that, except for the Financial Times did it after we did it. <laughs> I don't think they were following us. Um, but anyhow, um, the... Um, they have the, more the red whole, tape. Because. Yeah, they have other things going on there. More red tape. But um, but anyhow, like the whole point is that when we looked at this as an experiment just to see how good it could do, one of the things we were poignantly aware of is we fed it this transcript of an interview, and it's like, well, but the other aspects of obtaining that transcript are actually kind of a big deal, right? You have to have the relationships with whoever. You have to get that VIP mm. interview. You have to you have to know the questions to ask. So in fact, like the the from the transcript to the story is in many ways the least important part of that whole process. So I think that's one of the interesting things when you start unpacking this creativity concept is that mm -hmm. actually creativity is often the last step in a process that's uniquely human. So anyway, and and not easily duplicated by a bot. I mean, I suppose someday, I mean, there are bots like conducting like HR interviews right now. Well, and I don't know how you feel about that, but that's way, way to a point where bots actually going to be able to conduct an interview with a customer about an enterprise project for you mm -hmm. to write up on your yeah. blog. I don't see that happening anytime soon. And I don't see me get interviewed by a bot. If I, the moment I recognize that, the phone gets back to the hook. So the, how, how much more can you dehumanize? a potential employee of yours. Right. So this, this is where my bot interviews your bot. Sorry, <laughs> that, that, there, there's no other way. But a company that does do that hasn't heard the shot, really not. Well, I guess the markets are going to decide that, aren't they? Well, the, the, the market is not always smart. The market is greedy. Indeed. Uh, uh, yep. Well, that's a power play. <laughs> yep. But well, so there are. This, I mean, well, we can. That's that's a detour, a, a, a wide detour, but the term "human resource" already says it all, right? Well, right. <laughs> that's, the the yeah. next step is the bot interviewing the prospect. Yeah, I have this thing at the at the end of this deck, which is mm. like these things I call Johnisms or whatever. And they're, this is for another show, but they're just mm. different things about the enterprise. Um, but there's a couple that are relevant to this discussion. The, the bottom one is um, no technology, not even AI is above the need for project accountability, mm. agreed upon metrics from all parties, measuring those metrics on a continuous basis, which I think is really interesting because yeah, yeah. a lot of people seem to be taking this on faith that somehow AI is not yeah. accountable to, to project metrics and project ROI, but especially when you consider the costs, I think that's important. Yeah. But um, they, are, they are trying it. Remember, that's two months ago. Yeah. The Air Canada lawsuit that Air Canada lost. Yep. This was the bot promising a refund to a customer. Right, which the customer dared to <laughs> sue for, and guess what? He got wrong. He got his refund because the yep. bot acted as a representative of the company, of the company. and yep. not as a rogue entity. Yeah, yes. and and the law around all of that isn't yeah. fully established yet. But I think that case was a big wake up call to a lot yeah. of comp yeah. Yeah. companies who want to, like like you said, the market tensions around rolling this out quickly versus like you know, lawsuits get, get executives attention as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in the middle of this page, my, uh, if you plug, uh, this is supposed to say next gen tech off to fix that typo. If you plug next gen tech into a customer in different framework, you get customer hostile and different results. Mm -hmm. Same with AI. If you plug AI yeah. into such a framework, you get headcount reductions. Yeah. So, so I think that's one of the really interesting things about this whole discussion, right? Thomas is that it gets back to your point on human resources that, a lot of the problem is when you plug next gen tech into a flawed framework, you're going to get a flawed outcome, yeah. no matter how good the technology is. So, yeah. And uh, 
from a headcount reduction, there are two ways to think about technology, throwing technology at a challenge. One is getting better things done. Oh, well, three ways. The other one is getting things done better, however better it is. Less mistakes probably as a KPI there. And the other one is getting it done cheaper. So uh, now depending on the macroeconomic that is prevalent at any given time, companies tend to think differently. And a technology that promises efficiency and everybody promises efficiency, well, let's me as a decision maker probably first think of getting it done cheaper and cheaper doesn't mean less people initially till nobody buys my stuff anymore because they can't afford it anymore because they don't have income. But that's tomorrow's problem. So I, I do think that the whole framing matters. Yeah, for sure. Mm. And and it, it's one of the things that's given me pause in my whole thing around like, mm. well, you know, generative AI can't produce the quality of content that, mm. that you need. And it's like, well, but if AI gives mm. an executive air cover to do a headcount reduction mm. they've wanted to do anyway, yeah. then then my point of view on quality doesn't matter. Yeah. And and that's been a little bit of a cold shower that I've had to take on this whole topic. Um, but I'm not. I'm not retreating. I'm regrouping, and there's a really big Same difference. Yeah, well, uh, there's a yeah. tech, there's this thing of tactical retreat, right? <laughs> I, I, exactly. Now, the final point. I want to get back to the final point on this slide in a little bit. Uh, I think there's an irony in that we. I don't think we're necessarily creative en enough in our use of AI for the enterprise, and I think a lot of times, this is one of my big problems with the whole creativity and AI discussion is it's there seems to be an obsession with saying mm. oh this gen AI wrote something almost as well as I could have or whatever instead of like looking at what is uniquely capable with these technologies that humans aren't very good at so for example I had a very interesting session at a ERP show of all places with a bunch of gen AI startups and oh man they were drinking the generative AI Kool-Aid hard they were swigging it down I I have a hunch that I have a hunch that half the startups in that room aren't don't even exist because it was about six months ago. But there was one that really interested me because they were taking kind of a different mentality. They were in the entertainment industry, but they were looking at like, especially like genre things, right? Where people get obsessed with genre type activities, right? So you're a Lord of the Rings fan or you're a Game of Thrones fan or whatever, and you get super interested in the universe and the characters and stuff like that. You know, you, Star Trek might be another one. And so the idea here was create more interactive entertainment experiences where, so we might be watching a movie, but in midstream, you could stop and interact with one of the characters. And that character has been trained on the entire sort of history of that character and that worldview, right? And, and suddenly you're interacting with this character and like asking them questions mm -hmm. about this or that. You know, and I think it's super interesting because like I sometimes have done that like later, like I'll watch a show and then I'll go on Google and like be like, wait, because, you know, George R. R. Martin has all these elaborate family trees and stuff. And it's like, wait, who was related to who? And wait, who was actually married to their sister? And like, whatever, <laughs> mm. <laughs> trying to figure it out. And and so I just thought it was interesting. I'm not saying it's going to be successful. But what I liked about it was this notion of like, wait, these tools can actually do things that humans can't do, right? And And I think one of the things we're missing out on when we obsess about replacing human productivity with machines is we, 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 we lack the imagination then to say, what can this stuff do that the humans can't do? So anyway, I think that's something to come back to, I think a little bit. And th that's where I think that we are talking about not creative enough or not thinking far enough. Right. So everybody in the enterprise software world is to talking about smart systems. And there I'm with Bob Studs. He says there are no smart systems around. There are, well, algorithmic. There are not smart. A smart system to me is a system that adapts itself to changing environments. Means changing business processes, changing user requirements, changing user needs. And here is something that 
the strengths of generative AI along with the strengths of systems management, systems monitoring, process mining combined, low code, no code combined can create something that is really creative, mm. meaning a business system that supports me right now. And that does it right now. So this is something that's well likely a few years away. But this is combining the strengths of the systems. And right. don't know whether I would call that creative, but it's at least observant and well reactive in this in this instance. Because it will not see my next needs, but it will be able to adjust to my needs to my right, right now needs that is something that well whoever builds that i would call creative right exactly and i think that's a little bit about what i'm missing from this yeah. conversation yeah. currently is so much obsession around oh yeah. you know jenna Gen AI created a blog for me had a cmo on linkedin that was like check out the blog that Gen AI wrote for me and I, I read I read the blog and I mm. thought it was crap. Mm. Um, sorry, CMO. Um, but but it, it wasn't necessarily terrible. It just like it, and this comes down to like mm. what framework that you have for for reaching people. Like if 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 it's a search search engine optimization exercise, then it it's probably okay. Um, granted, search engine optimization sort of going out the window at the moment with Google trying to become an insular island and not not refer traffic to anyone but itself, so it can give shitty answers um, to it's questions. <laughs> um, but but um, so 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 I I just and why did I think it was crap? Well, because I think it was just jargon laden, like mechanistic prose with this like insidious techno optimism that is the road to me, the road to nowhere. Um, so, but <laughs> tell us how you really feel. Um, so anyhow, I would love to, um, hear a couple of comments from our audience. You've been uncharacteristically, yeah. uncharacteristically quiet today. We lost them. Yeah, we did. Um, but they're still yeah. here. That's a thing there. A lot of them are watching, but, mm. um, maybe they're just chilling and feeding their cats. I don't know. Or maybe, or maybe the link to LinkedIn is broken. Well, that could certainly be. Um, although it seems to be streaming at the moment, but mine is, by the way. <laughs> uh oh, is yours broken? Yeah. Ooh, we have issues loading this event. We oh no, grammatically even different. We are having issues loading this event. Not we do have so. Oh, interesting. So, That's probably why we probably lost. We probably lost some LinkedIn people. Yeah. So, but the yeah. So we probably got our Twitter peeps, and our Twitter peeps are probably not commenting yeah. too much. But sorry, they, what, LinkedIn, read sorry, those LinkedIn blogs, people. by the way. I do not. I do th do not think that. Oh, Ethan is still there. Uh, the at least as digital twin. I do not think that the quality actually deteriorated. It's just more stuff that is as bad as most of the other stuff. It means not really worth my time reading. And guess what? I get a bunch of them pushed, pitched as guest posts to my blog. So it's like, hey, I, no way that I can publish that. <laughs> yeah. Ethan's okay. digital twin is watching. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a good use case, right, Ethan? Because yeah. you can just get the ask your digital twin to provide a gen AI summarized, summarized bullets yeah. in this conversation. Mass testing is a very good case as well. Yeah. Or uh, and Ethan's saying it's Ethan's saying it's crashing fairly regularly and the page has to be reloaded. Sorry, mm -hmm. Ethan. I don't know what's going on with um StreamYard well, and LinkedIn. I had this problem last week also. Maybe we are attracting too much traffic. Gonna have to I think uh, I'm going to have to get my AI bot to contact uh, technical support over at StreamYard yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, Frank Scob was in the chat. Frank has been writing a lot on this topic. I uh, highly recommend you do a search on Frank's writing on this. Frank has put it, Gen AI through its paces. 
um, everything from song lyrics to God knows what. Uh, mm -hmm. If you spend enough time with NAI, you start to recognize the material written by it. Yeah, I would say so. Like the multi -le level bulletin list structure. Ethan says, I think a Zoom CEO is advocating having your AI avatar attend meetings. Sounds nuts. If you don't want to go to a meeting, just don't go. And it doesn't help so, because there's another AI that detects that's actually not you who is there and fires you anyways. Which happened recently, right? So there were, yep. what company was that? So they had some people, for the bank, I think, they had some people who were regularly having computer programs do something with their computer physically as well as mechanically or well as, as electronically and they got fired for, for cheating. So, Man, this is, you're ruining, you're ruining all the avatar dreams that I have of yeah, sending a, I was going to send an yeah. avatar to, to some shows this fall and I wouldn't have had to even go. Hey, you, you, your good news is you're your own boss, so you, you can't fire yourself. Or well, well, you can, but would you? <laughs> uh, not just yet. <laughs> See? <laughs> oh, Sam says that was Wells Fargo. Folks uh, let go for using mouse jigglers. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, they used technology to pretend being active. Or maybe they were active, but yeah. they did it on paper. Ethan says... Uh, Ethan Mollick is pretty clear that AI detection doesn't work well. He's primarily interested in academic context, AI authoring of papers, failure rate of systems that claim to detect this is incredibly high. Yeah, in fact, so much so, Ethan, that OpenAI even gave up on their efforts to create a tool to identify false pros. And I think there's going to be a lot of false positives here. There was a student, I think, that was kicked out of school for this at one point. And, yeah. you know, whether or not it was a false positive or not, it was a big controversy. I want to move on to the next slide. By the way, Thomas has no idea what's in my slide deck, so this makes things especially interesting for him. Uh, so, so, <laughs> so let's let's talk about exceeding generative AI. Like, let's let's concede for a moment the point that I was unwilling to concede earlier that these tools do create things, quote unquote. Uh, Josh Barnoff. Uh, used to call his website without bullshit. I don't think he calls it that anymore. But he defined what human writers should aspire to. Aspire to in his post chat, GPT is AI. AI is now a decent writer, so you need to do better. And so he asked what makes writing worth doing. His answer was original insights. AI doesn't have those. Engaging prose. AI is weak on that. Wit. AI still lacks that. And I would add in our industry, again, this problem of de-jargonizing like jargon free and take out all the insipid buzzwords and stuff. I added a compelling storyline and narrative. AI still sucks at that. Satire. AI can only guess at that. Subjectivity, honesty, inserting your own experience into your theoretical constructs, which by the way, I think is a valuable thing to do anyway, as far as acknowledging bias. And a lot of times when I write, I try to indicate what axes I have to grind because mm -hmm. I think it's useful for the reader to know that. Just like I have admitted that I have an axe to grind on this topic <laughs> because my entire profession and worldview is at stake to some extent here. So um, deep subject matter expertise. AI can only source that from whatever it is trained on. New ideas and newsy developments. AI is always chasing new ideas from behind. So this is to me like a little bit of a laundry list of what the if you want to take a more optimistic stance on all of this and not give in to the dystopianism of, of sort of like a world of like cheap, cynically created, con cynically generated content, I think this is the interesting challenge, which is to be more human and, and more compelling. And I think especially in the enterprise, God knows we need more of this type of content anyway. Uh, we've even before Gen AI, we didn't have enough of this yeah. type of content. <laughs> Yeah, the air. Um, well, what does Ethan have to have to say? He says, "Looking at chess and go may be instructed. Are we writing or doing art in order to be the best? If so, we may be in trouble. Are we doing it because it is inherently worthwhile? Then we'll be fine." Mm, there are the part in brackets at the end is the important part. Some of us live off it. 
so they are probably not fine if they <laughs> if they are ignoring the the economic aspects of it. So, um, I mean, ch chess. I agree. Go not so because the combinatoric explosion there is just too big even for gen generative systems. So, which w was to some extent proven by the fact that the champion system that beat all those go champions lost against a rookie a, a human rookie right who played for the first few times so that probably would have happened could have happened for a master go player as well in that case probably but but anyway so the what what i do think is your points are pretty important especially the satire the satire one and the changing of cadence one in the writing to keep it engaging this goes into the or the the answer of george yeah so i i think what keeps what, what makes something relevant is it needs to be on point answering a question that is or several questions that are currently there in a way that it's getting understood. The problem is that if it is done by John Doe, John Doe is probably not heard, even if he's the best writer on the world, on the planet, or of the whole universe, of the 50% right. that are remaining after the snip. Uh, even then, because he doesn't have the distribution. And th this is where the problem comes. This is where the whole SEO industry started off with, right? Make yep. sure that this John Doe is the one that gets top of the list. Right. Right. And and that's kind of the thing I noted in the yeah. first part is that the algorithmic economy yeah. plays a plays a major factor here that that yeah. pre predates generative AI, but has a lot to do with this discussion and should not yeah. be forgotten. Um, Ethan, I, I would take a little bit of an issue with the chess example, though. I think you make a really good point around why people would why would people still play it. <laughs> uh, but the the thing is that chess is a rule based system, and AI can be like taught how to win at that system. Creativity isn't like mm -hmm. that. In fact, some of the stuff that I watch the most on YouTube, like music wise, is actually people that aren't really that good, but their raw authenticity like affects me. And 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 affects me emotionally, and so I, machines aren't really good at that yet. Now, we're talking about a particular generation of AI that's based on deep learning models, and you know, this could change in the future. This is not the stances I'm taking here are not set in stone for all forms of AI that ever get developed. This is basically this form of AI, which is essentially doesn't have a world model and. I'm sorry, is not sentient at this point in time. Lucky but that could change. And we're not going to have the sentient debate today. Um, so here, here's another interesting one that's a, that goes a little bit beyond creativity, but it kind of gets into more soft skills. And this came from Diginomica, Chris Middleton, who writes a lot on AI for Diginomica and does a really good job. And he, he wrote about... Um, this notion of uh, soft skills uh, mattering more than ever. And I wrote that technical virtuosity doesn't cover it anymore. This is in my weekly Hits and Misses review. And I quoted, uh, Chris, what they look for is people who are brilliant at working with human beings, individuals with great emotional intelligence, communication, interpersonal skills, and problem-solving abilities. All those soft skills are often absent from a world that is focused on tech. Mm. And he, then Chris went on to point out that, that that's all well and good, but that's not what our educational system is producing. <laughs> mm. um, and, uh, and then critical thinking skills as well. Um, and then I went on to sort of take issue with some of the things that he had, Chris had asserted around seeding creativity to AI. Um, AI is making inroads. This is some of the stuff we've talked about today, particularly blunt force, repetitive con content creation like SEO content gaming and newsy summaries and image creation, thanks to all the artists whose work was unethically used as training fodder without a shred of consideration. <laughs> Gen AI can be useful for brainstorming also, though there are a few jobs to take there, but there's a certain kind of brilliant, sustained creativity Gen mm -hmm. AI can't do yet and won't be capable of anytime soon. And then I wrote, 
Granted, some enterprises think they can earn enough attention without needing that, and I think they're wrong, and I've tried to prove it. And I wrote about that in a post called B2B Buyer Engagement is a year-round endeavor, and AI isn't going to solve it. If you like this discussion, I recommend you check out that post uh, because that's kind of my latest stake in the ground around this topic. But it has to do with the idea that, that what we're really about in the enterprise world is reaching the right people and developing mm-hmm. trust with them by freely sharing our expertise and having impact on their lives in a positive way. And to me, that's what I'm going to do. And if I go down swinging and get subsumed by the algorithmic generative AI machine, then so be it. But this is where I'm taking my stand mm-hmm. and, yeah. and, and I'm not backing down from there. There is one thing around it that comes to the emotional intelligence part. Was it last year? I think last summer there some, a study was published that was about empathy. And basically what is empathy is, is could be in our first question now. But what, what they did is they tested doctors against a chatbot when it came to communicating the diagnosis. And Eight out of 10 or most of people said that the bot, without knowing that it was a bot, was more empathetic than the doctor. So this means, to me, it's always the question, is it a duck? And this looks like it sounds like a duck, it walks like a duck, and it swims like a duck. Then it probably is a duck, means empathy. So... Emotional intelligence, what is it? So can't AI, can't an AI system be already ahead of what, the average of us? Uh, in some cases, yes, because uh, in some cases, what what you need to interact with the system is more of a steady individual than anything else. And, and, mm-hmm. and AIs yeah. can be steady. So if an AI is helping you to solve a, a mm-hmm. problem, then yes. Um Ethan, you say, I think this is a little bit too indexed on how things are right now. You'd expect that Gen AI systems will become 90th percentile or better in most individual white-collar skills over the next decade or so. There's not a lot to feel good about here for undifferentiated workers. I agree with the last sentence, but not the rest. Um, mm. I, and, and, and look, I, I make a big distinction between, I don't think of it as skills as much as tasks. I think there will be improvement in tasks, mm. but I don't, see yeah. imp- I don't see improvements coming in things like problem-solving the ability to follow through on complex issues with customers and things like that. And th- look, this is a debate. There's some people mm-hmm. that think that Gen AI will continue to evolve and scale. Mm-hmm. I've spent a lot of time studying this and I take a little more the position of mm-hmm. Gary Marcus. If you look at his white paper, Deep Learning is Hitting a Wall that he published a few years mm-hmm. ago. That's that's how I perceive it. I think mm-hmm. I think we've hit a lot of the gains from Gen AI. There, there will be more. Yeah. But but I, I think it's going to require a significant additional breakthrough. And 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 Thomas recor- referred to expert systems. There may be an ability to, there may yeah. be some neurosymbolic things that come out of yeah. that that are interesting. I essentially, my position, Ethan, is that there's going to need to be another breakthrough before widespread jobs are annihilated around this. But, you know, I could be wrong. Like, I you know, this is a debate and one of the reasons you're probably picking up on that is that I don't take your position on that, but I understand mm. that other people do. I just, I just think additional breakthroughs are going to be required um, before that happens. That's all. Yeah. And they go via orchestration of systems. Yep. A, you, you are always a fan of, of customer use cases. So that was on a conference where a company represent was a customer service company. They had three key metrics, customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and automated solution rate. All of them shall be high. How did they do it? So they had all incoming inquiries come into an AI first, which created a solution, which was run against a CSAT predictor and if good enough was sent to the client. If not, it was sent back first to the machine and then to a human. Same with the human thingies. So and what they 
what human thingy. So, so same with the responses that humans gave. With that, they boosted their C set, their employee set, right. and their automation rate, which is quite fascinating. Yeah. And and look, that's going to happen in like, and, and, and Ethan, you know, this is a, like a debate, right? I could be wrong about this. Um, and you say there's a current amount of runway. I think so. But the thing is that unless the job losses are dramatic, what's going to happen is a lot of companies are then going to reinvest in growth and stuff like that and mm -hmm. create new roles. And so, yeah, you lose some, but then you gain some. And that's sort of my current position is I think there will be losses. Now, granted, like my slide indicated earlier, there's certain areas like translation and in certain kinds of image mm -hmm. creation and design work mm -hmm. where there's notable drop offs right now. And that, yeah. so there are some areas that are very targeted that, that are experiencing drop offs. You know, probably video production and video editing is going to be another one like that. Um, and Sam, you make a point um, current transformers aren't the magic bullet, give industry time. LLMs can't do math. They can write code that does math and currently confirm layering multiple LLMs together for task completion. Yes, task completion indeed. But that's mm. not the same as replacing people's jobs. And so that's that's the difference is the thing you've describing is unfolding over time. Yes, that's going to happen. Mm. But um, do I think it will someday happen? Yes, I actually do. I'm in the camp that someday those breakthroughs will happen and we'll have cognitive systems. But right now, for example, when I think about my use of Otter for machine translation, I'm struck by the fact that it does continue to improve incrementally and, and it still struggles with the quality of audio and accents mm -hmm. and things like that. Oh, um, <laughs> but, but just to give you an anecdote, just to kind of show you what I mean, um, I almost published an article that had the word Holocaust in it from in one of the quotes. And, and of course, that wasn't what anyone said because I don't write about uh, World War II. <laughs> I really didn't want that word in my article and it almost went in there. And, mm. um, and the point is that the LLM has no world model. It has no understanding of the significance of a word mm. like that. Now yeah. you could put in a guardrail, like some of the big vendors have done to teach it that that's a particularly volatile word. But the point is it doesn't understand the significance of it. And that's the kind of technology we're talking about. And the reason why I don't think what, what's being described now as far as massive job loss is going to happen is because these tools have some inherent limitations in the understanding of the context in which they're operating. And so that doesn't mean that they're not powerful though. And, and that's why I'm having this discussion today. I would not be having this discussion if I didn't think these were, these were powerful technologies. And by the way, they have a lot of productive use cases. And, and I think especially like this spring, I heard a lot of interesting use cases and, and I'm of the ma mind that even if they're not very sexy, they're still worth worth documenting because some sometimes unsexy use cases are actually the ones like like we're talking about that make a difference for for companies and give them an edge. So yeah. the least talked ones are probably the more ben beneficial ones because they are less well known. Yeah. So that's yeah. Uh, and, and that's a little bit of a yeah, fun yeah, debate I have yeah, with yeah. that's a fun debate I have with Brian Summer because my 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 fellow friend and foil Brian Summer on some of my video shows, Thomas, you know Brian well. Yeah. He's always saying, "Where's the big, you know, the big ideas, the big use cases, the new stuff, and you know, and job descriptions don't mm -hmm. rock his world or whatever." But you know, if if job descriptions save my HR managers twenty percent of time in a given week or whatever, then actually, that's a start. That's a start. Yeah, but. Then you could ask yourself, why does it take so much time to write this job description at all? If you can have a system that creates instant mediocrity, I can't, I can't do this word, <laughs> um, mediocre stuff faster, new, any, every time again, but well, just draw the free copy out of the drawer. So you're doing something horribly wrong if that saves you so much time. Then your whole system, your whole process is broken. Your whole idea of being different is broken because yeah. then you're actually not. So, yeah. And this means that the generative AI system doesn't solve a problem. Actually, it only shows you one at a, at a high expense, by the right. way. Yeah, right. Though, though I do think, I do think, like looking ahead a little bit, I do think that that some of the costs of these systems are going to are going to continue to come down 
And you alluded yeah. to that in terms of smaller models, more specialized models and things like that. Good. So, so Ethan says, personally, I don't think we even Ethan need the system to get much better. <laughs> the increase in productivity of high performing individuals will be the main way we see a gain. These people bridging gaps in reasoning and problem solving that LLMs have. It's a worrisome prospect. And we should probably be thinking about how to realign our organization so that we still have effective ways to train less experienced people and have meaningful, value, valuable work for people. Yeah, and, and Ethan, this is kind of, I think, where you and I are like aligned on this topic is I think it's important to have that conversation now, not later. Mm -hmm. So yeah. even, even if I might think this is going to unfold in like a longer period of time, um, then, then I think the job conversation does need to happen, especially like when you look at like junior level individuals and how they got footholds in particular industries to make sure we don't lose that particular transition for people. Um, so I totally agree that there has to be a conversation about skills inside of organizations and it is going to have an impact on people's careers because there's certain kinds of lower level roles that, that were often the way you kind of got your, you know, your spurs or whatever. And mm -hmm. some of those lower level roles are, are not going to be the same anymore. So we have to really take a hard look at that. Yeah. Definitely, and how to avoid being gained in from all involved parties. That's that's the most interesting part because there's so much black box in there that well, like the Google search algorithm, right? <laughs> so it's got it's gotten gamed since its existing uh, existence, hence it got changed all the time. So there, there. There are a lot of ethical and economical fun questions in there. That's yeah, and, and and the other thing that gets back to now we you can't see us because Ethan's massive quote is on the screen. Um, but <laughs> but but Ethan, the only thing I would say that I that I, we touched on earlier in the show, but you might have missed it when I was reloading this uh, when you were reloading, mm -hmm. is um is that 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 type of comment assumes like ethical organizations using this technology in an ethical manner. And I think like, like even if the tools in my view, aren't quite ready for certain things, unethical companies are going to go ahead and use them in the ways you're describing. Mm -hmm. And there will be headcount reductions. Now w at some point, will they have to rehire people when they're shown like, Hey, this chatbot's giving out bad information. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. You know, cause that's one of the main, one of my main contentions why these systems are not leading to this fast sort of headcount mm -hmm. reduction is because of the accountability and hum human supervision they still do require and will require for the foreseeable. But it's not the case in every case. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, there's a bot for New York business owners that is giving out incorrect information and they were, and they refused to take the bot down, even though that was exposed like nine months ago. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. if you're going to just plow ahead, then, then yeah, that is going to eliminate a lot of jobs. Um, yeah. I'm kind of operating on the assumption that most companies, even if they're kind of unethical about it, are ultimately going to get exposed through liability and stuff like that. And they'll have to like come back on that. But if you're not going to be ethical about it, then yeah, you can, you can wipe away huge swaths of people if you want to. So. Mm -hmm. Organizational flaws. Sam Sam says, "Well, see, organizational philosophies on AI become a, AI become a selling point for employees. Mm. Do I want to work for a CEO that wants to push for AI augmentation of existing employers, or ones that wants to trim headcount as much as possible and replace everyone?" I think that's a really, really huge point, Sam. And thank you for pointing that out. Um, that that is a vital point, and and I totally agree. I think that that the trust issue is going to be huge for this entire conversation. Yeah. It's going to be huge for content. It's going to be huge for how we do business with vendors and how, you know, we're, I think we're going to choose vendors whose AI approaches we trust. And to your point, we're going to want to work for companies that are using this technology in a humane way and being transparent about it. But also to Ethan's point, acknowledging areas where we are achieving efficiencies and where, where there will be changes to pretend like there won't be any changes is absurd. So I think yeah. that's a really good point. I mean, none of us object to getting rid of the boring aspects of our work. No. So, so <laughs> we would be stupid, wouldn't we? <laughs> right. Which brings us back to the very beginning of our discussion, doesn't it? With the, right. in, in case anyone missed it, this was the thing that really kicked this off was this. Yeah. I want AI to do my laundry yeah. and dishes so that I can do art and writing, not for AI to do my art and writing 
so I can do my laundry and dishes. See, what, what I responded yeah. to that one, by the way, was AI starts with the simple stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and, and it turns out that AI can do some pretty sophisticated things in the context of language, but in the context, uh -huh. of, um, in, in the context of the unpredictable physical world, uh -huh. not so much. Yeah. <laughs> not so much. Though, if you listen to the CEO of NVIDIA, you'll, you'll get a much more optimistic view. But keep in mind, he's selling shovels right now. Yeah. During the gold during the gold rush, yeah, and, it's and I am not. It's big time. So he, he is absolutely. Big time. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Thomas, for your willingness to workshop this with me. Thank you for going down That's this road. Always fun with you. Always. <laughs> did you did we miss anything that you wanted to comment on? Oh no! So we covered things. We probably could continue for an hour or two. Yes, we could. <laughs> oh, oh, but no, we we are good. <laughs> We are very good. Cool. And I want to thank the the chat for really opening yeah. up there at the end. Sorry for the technical problems we had earlier. Yeah. Ethan and Sam in particular, and Frank as well. But Ethan and Sam, thank you for getting into it in the chat. That adds a whole lot of that value was, because... That was good, yeah. Because, uh, you know, I have my take on that, but, you know, no one knows exactly how this is all going to play out. So it's yeah. really good to get different points of view. So thank you so much for that. And we might do workshopping again sometime next time. I well, have looking a forward to it. We'll totally find to another topic. There. Yeah, actually, I want to just check the slides real quick and see if there was one more thing in here. I can't remember. Uh, I think we're done though. Oh, there's a little Johnisms there. Customers are deluged in the barrage of AI vendor hype. Oh, yeah. Oh, and finally, keynotes are still too long and boring. Customers loom through interaction, not through keynote blather. Sorry, but I had to take a cheap shot. Oh my gosh. Maybe Will we, we ever learn? Maybe we should have them created by an AI and presented by an avatar. Yeah. Or maybe I could borrow Ethan's avatar <laughs> and use that to attend the keynote so I can do other shit. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, send your auto bot. Yep. Talk about good use of summaries. Please yeah. summarize the keynote for me yeah. so that I won't make a fool of myself in the vendor briefing, even yeah. though I skipped their keynote. That would be a good one. Yeah, just for the fun of it, you could download the transcript of this one after we hang up and send it through a summarization bot. <laughs> Let's see what that one says. Yeah. <laughs> I plan to I, I plan to do that, Thomas. I will send you the results. And and by the way, we transcripts need to break a stick for for StreamYard, what we are using here. Their transcripts are some of the best I've ever seen. Really? Yeah. Okay. So they are quite All right. good. So the, what they are not good at is segregating the speakers because it comes in one big blurb. <laughs> But in general, they, from, from an accuracy and word reception point of view, and well, word to text point of view or speech to text point of view, even with my horrible accent, they are amazingly good. Let's I'm give it a try, sure, Thomas. I'm quite sure they will have trouble with words like Zoho and S for HANA as well. But right. <laughs> hey, this is jargon then. <laughs> Well, fortunately, we avoided most vendor talk yeah. in this podcast, so this yeah, will give the transcript a good a good yeah, role. Yeah. I think we were relatively jargon free today. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for joining, and yeah. uh, I'll, I try to do these periodically on Friday afternoon, and love to have you. So thanks a lot for being here. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.